Welcome to the World War II History Hunter and our Flight to World War II series. Me and my son, we research and share interesting locations from World War II for all of you to enjoy and learn from. These flights takes us to all over the world and to many different stories and locations. If you'd like to support our work so we can reach more people, feel free to do so by subscribing, commenting, or you can actually use our PayPal donation button, which you find here or you can become a Patreon team member and receive some of these beautiful World War II artifacts that we create for all of you to be the future keeper of, or you can even donate on the Super Thanks feature here. So now let us find out where we are going today, my friends. Buckle up, get ready, because we are flying back to World War II. Today's journey will take us to a place where one of the largest types of guns were used during World War II. These guns were a substantial threat to England's safety and in one very special location they knew this all too well. Let us first fly to a place where they really knew and worried about the consequences of these huge guns that the Germans placed out in Europe. This is the Whitehall area of Westminster in London, England. During the Second World War, a group of basement offices in the Whitehall served as the center of Britain's war effort. The complex, known as the Cabinet War Rooms, was occupied by leading government ministers, military strategists and Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Here we can find Winston Churchill's war rooms. They became fully operational in August 1939, just a week before Britain declared war on Germany. The cabinet war rooms, as they were known as, were fully self-sustained and with even personal rooms for Churchill and his closest family, just like Hitler's bunker in Berlin. The war rooms remained in operation throughout the Second World War before being abandoned in August 1945 after the surrender of Japan. One threat that worried Churchill and his team quite a lot was the Germans' ability to target England and then especially the coastal areas and cities in England. The coastline of France was only 35 kilometers away and the Germans had a lot of their Atlantic world fortifications on the French coastline areas. This is the Atlantic Wall, the result of Hitler's Führer Directive No. 40. Build a continuous fortification line from the top of Scandinavia to the bottom of France. Tens of thousands of small and large structures built with one goal, to keep the Allies away from the coastlines of Europe. The Germans started to build the Atlantic Wall in 1942, plans were done earlier, thousands of structures and absolutely everywhere they fortified the beaches. They built so many structures that it is unbelievable. They even made bunkers look like houses as you can see here. And also hundreds of gun positions were placed directly on the beaches to prepare for any intervention by the Allies. And there was not one single beach on the whole coastline of the Atlantic Wall that wasn't covered with either barbed wire mines or details like that. Here you can see Erwin Rommel himself coming to inspect the uh, Atlantic Wall. And here's a fun fact for you. Erwin Rommel wanted more than 50 million mines placed on the Atlantic Wall. Winston Churchill wasn't too worried about the static performance of the Atlantic Wall as it was. As he said, this will be another chapter in history and we all know what that ended up being, the D-Day. But let us now travel to the French coast and see exactly where the area of this threat was. We don't have to fly far to find the area that Churchill defined as a huge threat against mainland Britain and the coastline, and that is the area of Pade Calais. And you can also see here on the map of the uh, Atlantic Wall how intense the German fortification was in this area. Flying over here, you can see that it is relatively flat, that meaning it was an easy task for the Germans to start establishing their Atlantic Wall right here and in the terrain here 
there are hundreds of different features ranging from the smallest machine gun position to one of the biggest installments that the Germans could do right here on the Atlantic Wall. Even today, in this era, you can definitely see the scars of war. Here at the Stutzpunkt, where the Germans had some installations, you can actually even see all the Allies artillery shell craters, and some of them are also bomb craters from the D-Day itself. So what was it that Hitler installed in this region that made Winston Churchill so worried? What installment did they do here? And can this installment be found here today? As you've seen here, this region had quite a lot of the features that was on the Atlantic Wall, but they all had one thing in common. They were static, they were for defenses, but they were not big enough or powerful enough to actually attack the Allies on the other side of the channel. This man wanted to do something about that, and he really did something about that. Hitler ordered this new weapon system to be started in the beginning of the 30s and it started to be produced here at the Kupp factory in Germany. It was meant to be able to reach the shores of uh, England and it was so successful that in 1936 the first test uh, firing was done and Hitler was so pleased that he actually awarded the factory leader with a very special medal for doing such a good job. This is what Winston Churchill feared. This is the German K5 railroad gun with a 283 mm caliper, weighted 218 tons with a 25 meter long barrel. It could fire a 255 kilo shell 64 kilometers out there. And that is why Winston Churchill feared this monster of a gun. The crew could fire about 15 rounds per hour. It was a tedious and hard job, so that was the limitation of the gun. The gun had limited traverse. Consequently, to set the bearing required, the gun needed to be rotated on a railroad turntable or moved along a curved track. They were housed in doom bunkers, concrete shelters or railway tunnels. They were used, made only 25 of these and they were placed on different areas here, as you can see on the Pas de Calais. Today there's only two left in the world and one of them are actually right here today. Before we have a look at the gun, the actual gun, I wanted you to see one of the uh, still standing doom bunkers. This one is in the city of Calais and you can see this long concrete construction. That is where they took the gun in and hid it and kind of protected it when it wasn't in use. You can see a small bunker next to it that's a munition storage and the munition storage had, it all, had its own a narrow track railroad system so they can transport the huge shells out to where the gun was at any given time. So there are very very few still left of these and this one is actually one of those that you can walk up to and you can study it, look at it and in that way get the feeling of how big the complex was to support such a gun. There are only two of these left in the world and to find this one you don't have to fly far you are just going to fly to the former German battery tot and the museum there. This is former German battery tot. The Germans installed four huge casemates in concrete, installed 38 centimeter naval guns in there, and around 400 German troops served and did their duty here. This is where the Germans could protect themselves from attacks from the Allies, but they could also plan and execute attacks against and towards England from this position here and this is where you today can find one of the two still existing German K5 railroad guns. Being close up to one of these guns you really start to understand why Winston Churchill thought this could be the biggest nightmare of them all. They could reach England so 
AC. This is such an incredible place to see. So if you're there, check out the casemates, the huge concrete casemates while you're there, because they're just as impressive. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching this episode of uh, Flight 2 World War 2. And before you know it, we will be back with more. Stay safe, keep smiling, and remember, history is everywhere.